welcome to Emergence. This is your host, Dan, where once again I'm interviewing an uh, author. Her name is uh, Katie Cord, and uh, she's written uh, a book entitled He Left Her at the Altar, She Left Him to the Zombies. And uh, I've got her online here, and we're going to talk about her book and her other projects that she's got going. Katie, are, are you there? I guess I'm here, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for calling in the show. I sure do appreciate it. So is this your first book? He left her at the altar and she left him to the zombies? Or have, have there been books before this one? No. Um, he left her at the altar. She left him to the zombies. Um, is a collection of short stories that was originally um, written and published in 2011. I just recently had it re-edited, got a new cover, and re-released it. The cover art. Did you do that yourself, or did somebody do that for you? Um, No, actually, the cover art was done by Eloise J. Knapp, who is also a zombie author and graphic designer. Um, She did take, you know, some direction from me. I kind of told her what I wanted. Um, And then, of course, being an amazing graphic designer, she took it to a whole new level. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, we both had a little uh, work meant, but all of the art is Eloise. The zombies theme that you write about, where does that come from? Why, why, the, why zombies? I, I, I've written about this several blogs, but um, I never get tired of telling it. When I was seven years old, I come upon the original Night of the Living Dead, and I was raised a Southern Baptist and had a Sunday school teacher who was a very literal Bible reader. And um, after watching the movie, I really thought – when everyone arose from the grave, when Christ came back, that was what was going to happen. Um, and so I kind of developed an obsession with zombies from that time onward. Yeah, I, it was actually a very terrifying experience. And I had a very young parent who, um, you know, we lived out in the country there. I was actually home alone um, when I was seven. So uh, they didn't even know I watched the movie. Um, and they were very open to letting us watch or do or read whatever we wanted. And so... I was allowed to watch zombie movies after that because that's what I like to watch. And my mom was very supportive of our addiction to horror and science fiction. So, yeah, I've, I've always been a fan. And whenever, um, two, I think it was like 2005 rolled around and World War Z came out and we had Shaun of the Dead come out, I was just like, oh, my God. It's like my dream has come true. This fandom has really just blown up. And so I really started trying to uh, – delve into the story that I, I wanted to tell about zombies. I noticed that, um, that you know, every uh, every writer and, and movie um, that, that does zombies kind of has their own um, rules of how the zombies work. You know, some are slow moving and some are fast. Some eat brains and some eat body parts. Um, I noticed a few things in your book, uh, your stories, you know, that, that kind of had its own rules with zombies. Like um, one thing I noticed was the zombies had an expiration date, like they of eight years or something like that. What, what's, what's that yes. about? Well, that mostly has to do with um, the genetic mil- manipulation of how um, they were created, which is in the first story. Um, the original story is about this woman who wants to cure her wife who has multiple sclerosis. And so she is trying to manipulate DNA to get that to work. Well, and, you know, I don't know if it, science comes across, but what this company has created is they're, they're actually creating slaves. They're curing people with autoimmune disorders and genetic problems. And then people who are completely normal, it's unraveling their DNA slowly. So the zombies are dead, but... What is happening is that the DNA from the uh, zombie virus is actually slowly just tearing them apart. And I really felt like zombies have to have an expiration date. I mean, if the body is decaying, it's not going to live forever. It's not going, you know, the natural, um, it might be slowed, but the natural decomposition of the human, you know, tissue and organs is still going to happen. And you've got to give them some kind of day when they're going to, go away, you know. <laughs> I also noticed, like, in your story, it was a border patrol it talked about zombies making droppings, you know, like using the bathroom. I'd, I'd never heard that before. Oh, yeah. Actually, um, 
the character is talking about um, humans, that he's comparing them to cockroaches. Um, he's actually not talking about the zombies as much as these are just infected um, live humans trying to get across the border. And so he's, um, he's comparing those humans to cockroaches who are trying to invade his country. First people get a virus and then they die and then they turn into zombies? Yes, yes. Um, this universe that I'm creating is called my Rothschild universe, and there are, a majority of the stories in this collection have some kind of tie to Rothschild, um, including Border Patrol. Um, and so you're seeing a time frame, you're, you're looking at, you're in the mind of Sophie Martinez, and she's looking out at the United States, and they've been told in Mexico that the Americans are the only people who have this disease, and they have to keep the Americans out of Mexico. And so Sophie is on the border actually trying to keep Americans out of Mexico. I've got a short piece here uh, that you were nice enough to send me that I can play from that uh, Border Patrol. I'd like to, to play that, and then we can get back and talk about it. Is that okay? Oh, that sounds great. One second. Sophie Martinez peered through the holographic site. She saw them. Like ants on a scouting mission, they scurried across the valley oblivious to the fact that snakes love the desert at night. They slithered through the dirt, then fed and cooled their bellies, just like she was doing now. Coyotes yowled on a mesa, probably 30 or 40 miles away. The prickly shaped hairs on the back of her head pimpled up. Only on her dying day would she admit that coyotes scared her more than rattlesnakes. The night sounds were interrupted by the crunching of dry red clay under combat boots. Instinctively, she rode on her back, gun in the air. Whoa, it's just me! Acosta threw his AR-15 down next to her, a little too close for comfort, then flopped down. He took off his night vision goggles and smiled. He had the sweetest smile with white straight teeth and a dimple on his cheek, but he was career and at times a monster. So are any of them glowing in the dark? He always joked about them. She shook her head. He took out his binoculars, surveyed the movement below, then looked her way. You still think of them as human? They're not, you know. They're like cockroaches. All they do is crap all over everything, leave their disgusting droppings everywhere. My brother found a skeleton once, gold hoop earrings lying perfectly in place where their ears should have been. Fucking idiots. They ran over here screaming, help, save me, I'm not infected. His face contorted. They need to help themselves. She lay there quietly listening to his evening spiel. People with opinions like hers had learned to be silent long ago. Get through the duty. Then she could go to school, have a baby, or lie on the beach drinking beer. Once your tour was over, your life was yours. Damn, girl, are you ever going to talk? She rolled over onto her stomach. The caravan crept along, probably 30 of them, all infected, desperate to cross. Their headsets went off. Team 4, we're heading more your way. Looks like the best shot on this group is from your angle. Keep it discreet. Try to run them off. The sun will do the rest tomorrow. More guys like Acosta would be here tonight, guys who threw guns around like toys. There would be more talk. Her silence would be unbearable. They should just end it tonight. Fell herself wanting to press the call button and say something. Tell the captain it wasn't humane to do people like this. They would mill around in desperation through the night and shrivel up like raisins tomorrow. Do your time, Martinez told herself. And that's from the story of Border Patrol. Where do you draw inspiration for your uh, for your writing? Like a story like that uh, has, you know, kind of like a scientific and uh, and military background. Do you have a military background? i um, a little bit. Um, I think mostly though, this story came from actually watching uh, National Geographic's Border Wars. You know, just watching um, like how some of like the talking about the woman earrings laying on the ground. Um, what I was actually listening to a coroner from Maricopa County in Arizona talk about how these people are so desperate to cross the border that, you know, they will die of dehydration in the desert and just be laying there. Um, and they'll find the reason that they know they're there is because they'll see a glint of an earring or a watch or something and because they're out in the middle of nowhere and they'll just see it like from the sky. Or, you know, someone will be driving and they'll see a hint of a of metal or a piece of clothing and they're just out there. You know, no one knows that they're dead. Um, 
but they're so desperate. They were so desperate that they were willing to try anything to get out there. And I, I kind of wanted to reverse that on Americans because you hear so many um, things in the news about immigration and so many racist things. And I was like, well, what if America was no longer, or even the United States actually, was no longer a place where we could be um, safe and we needed to go somewhere else? How would those people perceive us? How would we feel if they thought of us the way we've heard people talk about them? Like, there are people who think of people who are immigrants in this country as cockroaches, and that's not just with Hispanic people. That has been with when the Irish came to this country. Anytime there has been a new group of people who've tried to come into the country and be accepted. And so I really wanted to play with that and um, just kind of have a different perception of it and see if people were, could get the tones out of that. And I, I, I don't know, I just love playing in zombie worlds, and I felt like this was a, a topic that was important for me to explore, and this is how I explored it. You always take your stories from a female perspective. A lot of them seem, you know, like uh, demonstrating that people, you know, um, faced with something like this wouldn't be so accepting of it and kind of reject the new uh, reality that they're pushed into. And uh, they they think that by, you know, kind of throwing a tantrum or yelling and screaming and, you know, uh, that they can, uh, you know, get people, the zombies to cooperate or something, you know. And um, <laughs> they they don't, uh, you know, they, at first they don't fight back. It's like they want to argue their way out of things. Is that a theme you like to play with? Well, I think I uh... Especially, like, I think one of the stories you're talking about is he left her at the altar. She left him to the zombies. And um, I just wanted, I was like, when I was thinking of this story, I was just like, you always see that bright villain on TV or you know that, that person who just has to have their way, that mean girl who everybody either does what she says or you're dead to her. And so I just wanted, I was like, how would she deal with the zombie apocalypse and I you know I really feel like you know if she was that self-centered and narcissistic yeah she would be like look a bunch of people are not stopping my wedding I'm getting my way you're going to do what I want this is not the reality I accept so we're going to go with the reality I want Um, and then because a lot of narcissistic, sociopathic people do really well in the world, um, even in the corporate world, she kind of starts to navigate reality like, oh, man, this is really happening. Like, well, how am I going to survive? How am I going to take advantage of this? And so, yeah, with that story, I did kind of go there. But I do write from a female perspective because I want to write stories that kind of portray how I think a woman would really think in these in these uh, situations, not stories where not every woman is going to know how to use a gun. Not every woman is going to use brute force to get her way out of a situation. She's going to use the things that she's been trained and socialized to use, um, and she knows how to make work and then adapt accordingly. And so that's really why I tend to write from a female perspective um, in my stories. Um, I try to write from a male perspective before, but I, I feel like my, my true voice is, you know, representing women um, and the things that they go through. I got a, a little uh, piece that you read from uh, the he left her at the altar and she left him to the zombies. This is a little sample uh, with uh, Katie Cord doing the radio. I didn't technically kill him. I had a choice. Close the door and move forward or keep the door open, giving the two and son of a bitch a chance to make it. Since the horde was behind him and he had a limp, I made my decision, I stuck to it, and I have no regrets. Sure, it was made easier since a day earlier he'd left me at the altar, and later I found out he'd been sleeping with my sister. Do I blame her? No, we're even. I left her outside the car as I sped away from the first group of flesh-eating brain-dead. How do things like this happen? One minute you're throwing a fit because the caterer says he can't deliver the all-you-can-eat golf shrimp he promised to finding out your little sister is blinking your future husband. What kind of wedding day is that? I wouldn't call myself a bridezilla, but I'm sure I made life a little difficult for those around me. I just wanted the perfect wedding to my perfect guy. Derek was it. He was tall, lean, and absolutely amazing dresser. It didn't hurt that he came for money. I needed someone with a lot of money. 
sport. How else can you get things you need? You can't go into a country club wearing anything less than Ralph Lauren. I'm really good at making plans, and my wedding was going to be the party of all parties. I was the first of my friends to get married. I would make the expectations so high that no one could top me. Yeah, I know. There was this whole thing on television about staying at your house and people getting sick. All I heard was that I definitely needed to continue with my wedding because nothing else good was going to happen that weekend. Only increased the chances the event was going to be memorable. I spent all Friday calling caterers, florists, the preacher, the cleaners, the coordinators, and rationalizing guests. Okay, so I yelled a lot. Seriously, people are going to stay in their house and hide because allegedly a couple people were committing cannibalism? I've been called a cannibal floor, but I've also been called Medusa, Satan, the Dark Princess. The list goes on. Are any of those things true? No. So why would I believe a couple of drug addicts were running around eating people? I really felt like someone just wanted to ruin my wedding. Turns out they did, but it wasn't the flesh-eating freak. So the title, like you used that for the title story. Why, why did you do that? I don't know. I just I thought it was really original, and I had never heard um, anything like it before. And so it was like, this is this is the title story. And um, there's like a, a part of me that just really loves Madison Montgomery because I'm so not like her. Um, and so I, I don't know. It, 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 it's a, it sees a little bit of a dark side that, you know, I would never do any of the things that she did, but it's still fun to play in that world. And I think it's, like I said before, I think having this character who – it's incredibly narcissistic, a little bit of a sociopath, but just really fun. He's just fun. Um, really brought that element to the book, and um, I don't know. I I just once I came up with the title, I was like, this is this is it, and I I can't use any other title. <laughs> so yeah, that's. But I wanted to point something out real quick because um, I, I hadn't caught this before. Um, when she's talking about can- drug addicted, addicted cannibals, this actually story was written before all of those crazy like people were taking drugs and biting people in like I think Florida. So I I actually didn't take off from that. Um, I wrote that before, and I just thought that was really cool. I was like, wow, that ended up happening. <laughs> the story at the end of the book, um, and baby makes three. Um, that one is, you know, kind of a, a thing where uh, two people are kind of uh, on their own in the middle of, uh, you know, the, the zombie apocalypse, and uh, they end up uh, with a baby. That's not their baby. That was somebody else's baby. Is that what – it was like a, a woman that was dying or something like that? Yes. So um, that story is about Erin, um, and Erin was brought to you in the story marriage where she is trying to – reconcile her love with her husband and finds out she's pregnant. So at the end of the book, you have this story where you find out she didn't have her baby. Oh, I'm telling the story. But anyway, and um, so this story is about her and this guy she meets, Rob, and they are on the run because they don't want to become part of the Rothschild, they call it the Rothschild family. Um, and so they're running and um, they come upon this lady who is having a baby and is converting to a zombie. And um, Erin is a nurse, and so she cuts the baby out. And then there's something very different about this baby immediately. And so um, Rob and Erin realize they need to protect her. And so that's pretty much what the story is about. And I always, uh, my new book that's coming out, Maxine, is actually, this story is how she was born. Um, so you kind of get that. If you read Maxine, you can always go back to the story and be like, okay, this is how Rob and Aaron became who they were. This is how Maxine was born. Um, and this is why they made the decisions that they made. Um, and then and I have an in chapter of Maxine, or the first chapter of Maxine in there as well. Yeah, you've included in, in the end of your book the first chapter of, of Maxine. Yes. Um, that does look like it, it's going to be a good story. So basically, they they end up with a baby, and uh, and then the the baby, there's some kind of superpower or something something to do with the baby that's uh, mysterious and is going to be revealed in in your next book. Is that what it is? Yes, 
Yes, that's correct. Because um, through all of these stories, you're reading about genetic manipulation. And I also have a book that I'm putting up um, online for free called Will and the and the End of the World. And so all of these stories and these two books are, are in the same universe. And they all play off of each other. And so you're going to find out in, the, in Maxine that they've been playing with genetics for like the last 15 years and they've destroyed everything and then now we're here. But what they're finding is with these new generation of people who are being born, um, things aren't quite right regardless of if how the child was born. Um, and then Maxine specifically, um, she is has a little bit of a different, her manipulation has allowed her to do something very different, which you see that she has from the minute she's born. And she doesn't know it, but um, everyone else in Maxine knows it as far as the adults go. So you kind of see what happens with her. And, and I, the tagline we're looking for for the book for uh, Maxine is, um, sometimes high school can eat you alive. So... <laughs> So it kind of gives you a little uh, idea of what's going to happen with her. <laughs> okay, and uh, here's that little uh, excerpt from uh, the novel, Maxine. The gymnasium was massive. The glossy wooden floors felt like they went on forever, and the ceiling made Max dizzy when she looked upwards. She was staring up at the ceiling when the volleyball seemingly appeared from nowhere and hit her in the face. The leather ball smacked her cheeks so hard that ringing screamed through her ears, Pain stared through her face. As the ringing decreased, a crescendo of laughter took over. The laughs echoed around the gym. She felt the ball go thump, thump, thump by her feet. Hey, Mrs. Shits it. Pay attention or next time you might get knocked out. Sue wasn't a glowing girl, but she was tall and sturdy. Playing sports in gym class allowed her to excel in a place where in other classes she failed. Normally, her aggressive behavior was ignorable. But as Max picked up the volleyball to toss it to the server, a tightening occurred in her throat. The small hairs on the back of her neck raised, and she felt her normally slow heart rate speed up until it felt like it would explode. Are you going to throw the ball or what? Sue yelled. The blood pulsed through Max's body so hard that she was sure every vein that crawled up her neck and face was ready to pop. The nails on her finger felt as though they would pierce the volleyball. Before Max could rationalize the feelings, her body reacted. The ball hit Sue square in the nose. Without thinking, Max's mouth flew open. I hate your stupid flipping face! The scream was magnified by the shock of silence. Mouths were agape as wide eyes looked back and forth between Max and Sue. Blood seeped through Sue's fingers as she tried to put the pressure on her nose. Max felt split in half. Part of her felt like she was seeing Sue through a telescope, while the other part felt like she was sitting in the bleachers watching someone else act in her place. As her heart started to slow, her legs wobbled and she slid to her knees. Slow, deep breaths replaced her rapid, ragged breathing. She felt completely in her body again. The gym teacher ran to Sue with a towel. No one came to check on Max. Everyone circled Sue as though they were protecting her from Max. A crooked smile spread across her face. The weakest student in the entire school put fear in the heart of all the healthy young women, she thought. Her elbows pressed into her knees as she kept her head propped up with her hands. On the gym floor, a shadow crossed over Max. She turned her head to see Nathan Nevada walking across the bleachers, his face grim and full of concern as he looked at Max. He jumped down from the bleachers and walked out of the exit door back into the school hallway. An odd look for an odd day, she thought. And that was uh, from the book Maxine. And you also have uh, other projects that uh, you work on, um, like um, you do publishing of your own. You have a publishing company of your own that you that you're involved with. Yes, um, I own a publishing company called Evil Girlfriend Media. Uh, we publish science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Um, we have one full-length book currently out, which is a young adult novel called The Heart-Shaped Dimbler by Elena Ewing. Uh, we have a collection of short stories out by Jennifer Brozak called Apocalypse Girl Dreaming. Um, and then we have four anthologies out. Um, we have several books coming out in the fall, um, which horror, science fiction, um, and then we have a Kickstarter starting um, in May for our newest anthology, Women in Practical Armor, which is a fantasy um, anthology. I keep looking at your Kickstarter page, and you're gaining a lot of support already. Um, 
Oh, oh yeah, uh, that's actually that is a Kickstarter that I'm an author in. Um, that that Kickstarter is actually by Ragnarok Publications. Um, they're actually good friends of mine, and um, that which doesn't mean that's why I got in the anthology, but. Um, they, I'm very supportive of them. They're a small publisher, and um, I submitted a story to them with Ken Skoll um, for this genus Loki, um, which is about the spirit of place. And we have a story about uh, basically these aliens that came to the Earth, and every year they meet in Cannon Beach, Oregon. And so it's just like a glimpse of their um, reunions and what they have, and it's a it's a little bit of a love story and um, has a lot of science fiction elements. I'll be sure and include those um, links. So you're saying you have a Kickstarter of your own uh, going and yes. you're involved with this? What exactly is that? Okay, yes, our Kickstarter does not start until um, May, and it is for Women in Practical Armor which is edited by Gabrielle Harbowy and Ed Greenwood. Um, they approached me about a year and a half ago uh, with this idea of putting together a collection of short stories that are fantasy-related, where there are women warriors um, who are in armor that wouldn't actually get them killed. Um, and so we've had a really good time putting this together because you know, for the longest time, you know, you saw these characters who were women, and they were super strong, and they could carry, you know, swords. It was like, you know, 15, 20 pounds, swing it, kill people. But they were wearing bikini chain mail while their male counterparts are wearing full armor. And so we kind of wanted to, to shift that. We wanted to have stories where, you know, these are amazing warrior women who also have enough common sense to cover their abdomen. <laughs> so that's what that's about. And um, we are going to start funding in May. So um, so this, they are separate. And I, yes, I, I'm, I'm always in a lot of things. I'm usually doing too much. <laughs> so um, you, have, uh, you have three dogs, it says, on your uh, Amazon page. What, what are their names? Um, I have a Rottweiler Beagle named Mama Dog, and I have a mix of a Lab and a Chow and a Golden Retriever whose name is Haley, and I have a Border Collie, mostly Border Collie, um, named Hilo. Um, they are all rescue dogs from the Navajo uh, Reservation um, because I used to work out there as a nurse, and um, they all just became part of my family. I've had them about eight years. You're uh, you're also a, a nurse by night. Yes, I am a registered nurse, um, and I am a United States Public Health Service officer. Um, so I I lead a pretty busy life. <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, so it's uh, nursing, writing, uh, publishing, um, Kickstarter campaigns. Um, are you are you always going to be writing zombie books, or is it is it uh, you know, any, any romance novels in the future or anything like that? Um, I, you know, I don't know. I tried. Actually, my first attempt at starting to write again was a romance novel. Um, and I had never been a romance reader or um, just really involved with romance. And I actually found it incredibly difficult to write a pure romance. Um, I do put romantic elements um, in my writing. But um, I don't I don't know if I'll ever be writing truly in the romance genre. Um, I did write that romantic story with Ken Scholes, which is a science fiction story. Um, I tend to be really dark, though, as far as the romance side goes. I don't know what that says about me, but, <laughs> um, but no, I don't I don't know. I do like science fiction. I have the outline for a book I'm calling The Martian Miner's Daughter. Um, and uh, I wrote the story, bonus story, and he left her at the altar. She listened to the zombies, which is green as gold, um, which takes element of uh, classic science fiction, um, the poem by uh, Robert Frost, and, yeah, it's, it's just a really... That's the bonus story at the end of, at, at the end of your book, right? The green and gold. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sure you can tell anyway, I read a lot of um, classic sci-fi. <laughs> We're wrapping this up because uh, it, they're, they're going to stop recording, 
in five okay. seconds. So thanks for joining me on my show. Uh, this was Emergence with Katie Cord.